Thanks for joining us this morning for day two of the Virtual Sun Conference. I'm Scott Bogren. I'm the executive director here at CTAA. And we are, uh, for the next hour and change, going to discuss legislative policies and we've uh, uh, and, and going to look at kind of three different key topics, um, CARES Act 2.0, reauthorization, appropes. We're happy to discuss other issues and we'll be taking questions, but that's kind of going to be our focus and we're going to look at that from the perspective of what has happened, what we think is going to happen next, and then most importantly, take some of your priorities. Um, I am uh, uh, from a from a Zoom perspective. I would ask you, uh, you're you're all muted, and uh, it is a meeting format. Please put any questions you have into the chat box, um, as they are kind of concurrent to topics we're covering. I'll introduce those questions. Um, Further, at the, at, at the end of kind of the formal presentation, uh, uh, I will ask for you to, um, uh, if you have a comment, you want to add anything just to give me your name, and then I will call on you. You can unmute yourself and fire away. Um, you'll also see that in the way we're setting this session up, we're going to ask for your priorities. In some cases, you may not have a question, but you want to tell CTAA uh, that your priority in this topic is X, drop that in the chat box, kind of use that like it's a big whiteboard in the room that we can, we can gather some intel from you. So uh, let's try to use the, use, the, uh, use the Zoom feed that way. Uh, I am joined today by really um, two of my favorite people in, in, in the entire transit field and folks that I'm, I'm so happy could, could join us. I'm going to start off with Ed Redfern. Ed is the executive director at the Bus Coalition. Give us a wave, Ed, so everyone, if you don't know Ed, Ed's joined us at a number of Sun conferences. Uh, Ed and I go back a long ways, and uh, uh, you know, I think my first working with Ed was when, and he still does, uh, do a lot of work with the Iowa Public Transit Association. Uh, uh, Ed uh, worked for Senator Grassley's staff uh, in, in, in another life, uh, and transit isn't the only thing Ed works on, but Ed, Ed's focus has been on bus, bus funding and bus capital issues, and, and Ed and I have had kind of, I would call it the joy of going from about eight years ago trying to figure out how could we create more money in bus capital to now how do we carve up more money and make sure that everyone's getting their equitable share which is a much better place to be than where are we going to find the money so um ed thank thanks for joining us i uh, really appreciate it and also today we have uh, rich sampson who's the executive director at the southwest transit association probably doesn't need any introduction to all of you here since there would not be a Sun Conference without Rich. Uh, he, he really helped us launch this when he, during his years at CTAA. Rich is a um, dyed-in-the-wool transit nerd, and I mean that in the most positive way, uh, uh, and, and also someone who um, we're just we're just so thankful that as he's gone off and doing all the great work he's doing for the Southwest Transit Association that we're still able to work with Rich here at CTAA. Uh, we are not surprised at all at all of the accomplishments and things he's bringing to the Southwest Transit Association. Uh, we knew that would happen when he, when he left, but it's, we're real grateful to have him back. So thanks, thanks Rich for joining us. And uh, let's, let's jump in. So the first topic that we want to tackle today is the one that's kind of right in front of all of us, which is what is going to happen with this next round of supplemental appropriations responding to COVID-19. We're, we're calling it CARES Act 2.0 here. But a couple of, uh, before we jump right in, I think 
just kind of stage setting. This is likely going to be the last bite at this apple prior to the election. So, you know, this truly is kind of within these supplemental approaches. This is the last train leaving the station uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, it is mired in all sorts of partisanship um, and, and uh, the three of us, uh, Rich, Ed and I, we could solve all that real quickly if they would just let us, but um, that's not the way it works in DC right now. So I'm gonna start off with um, Rich, talk about some of the issues that you see in terms of like what's happened thus far on the negotiations around a new CARES Act. Well, thanks, Scott, and glad to be with everybody here again at the Sun Conference. Uh, wouldn't miss a year. I uh, wish we were together in Missoula, but yeah. uh, here we are anyways. Uh, setting the stage for the CARES Act was the HEROES Act um, that was introduced in the House of Representatives earlier in the spring, and not introduced, only introduced, but made its way through the House. Um, a very aggressive piece of legislation uh, to further the CARES Act um, and a lot of transit funding in it. Uh, I believe it was about 15 billion total in that, in the HEROES Act. Um, overall, the, obviously, we don't wanna say no to any kind of money, but the way that that money was put together, um, there's a lot of concerns about the distribution of those funds uh, in the House bill, mostly going to the largest transit systems, uh, especially in New York. Now, we of course all know that there are exceptional needs at those largest systems, Nobody's dis disputing that. Um, but the way that the bill was put together was to use the emergency relief program is kind of the mechanism to distribute the funds. And all but the largest systems really have a problem with using that. They'd much rather see the established formula programs, even if there's some disagreement on those formulas, those are predictable, they're known. I mean, it's what the CARES Act used to distribute the funds initially. So. I can tell you as a system, an agency that represents Houston Metro that was instrumental in creating the emergency relief program for transit, even they're not happy about using that program. And they're a fairly large you know, system that has rail and BRT. Uh, they'd much rather see it go through the formula program. So uh, it's hard to say what's gonna emerge out of the Senate's bill to follow up heroes and how they'd merge those two together. Uh, a lot of suggestions seems to be that if the Senate can pass a bill, that uh, that would imply that there's agreement between Pelosi, Trump, and, and McConnell. And if that happens, the Senate bill would probably just be accepted again in the House. But there's a long way to go between here and there. So we want to see if anything happens here that the formula programs really be the model to distribute that next round of emergency relief. Um, and we, we were really happy though in the CARES Act to see that NCD reporting waiver uh, included there. And, and, to, and to give credit where credit's due, APTA did a lot of great work on that one in particular. Uh, we also want to see that one go through in any second piece of legislation. So uh, that's my initial take on the CARES Act um, and what the Senate might do. I think there's a lot of you know pitfalls between here and it passing and the president signing. Uh, but I think there's likely going to be some kind of transit relief in the second bill, probably not as much as CARES Act. So that's SWAT's take, Scott. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the HEROES Act um, moved so quickly and when, when it did, and it really shifted a lot of funding just to those, uh, was it the 14 largest transit systems? Um, and, it was a, um, and it was kind of a, a distribution mechanism outside of what the traditional transit groups were even calling for. And I think that was one of the things that, that, that I found so kind of troubling about it is like, like where did this concept come from and how much kind of uh, uh, freelancing is going on right now when it, go, when it comes to this. Uh, uh, we followed up with the Senate immediately to say, follow the formulas and uh, uh, have been focused on with the Senate side trying to get as much funding to flow to the traditional formulas and really for two reasons. And uh, uh, we, we've shared that letter publicly. And the two reasons were one, 
But we think that um, that's the swiftest and most clear cut way to distribute funding in terms of just the mechanisms of making it happen. Uh, FTA can, can manage that quickly. And then there's the fairness aspect to it. Uh, the formulas are set up to reward those who provide the most trips already. And why shouldn't this in many ways follow that has been kind of our take. And, and we've been also very vocal about wanting to see 5310 finally get some funding because of because of this so so yeah i think that's a that's a big issue ed i know the bus coalition weighed in on the senate side can you talk to us about that uh, what we did uh we weighed in and said okay you want to put 16 on the house side you want to put 16 uh, billion dollars into these top programs and unless you're three million population or more, you could not take part in their program. Right. Uh, and then the rest of the funds, they uh, said, okay, uh, we want to set up a program that again, most of our transit systems in the country couldn't take part in with $4 billion. So we said, let's take the $4 billion uh, when we talk to the Senate and let's put that into 5339, uh, A, B, and C, but only for systems under 3 million people. Okay. So if, if you took the formula funds, uh, it should, uh, for those smaller, medium-sized systems, you should see a higher amount of funds in, in that program because the uh, formula program, that's the 5339A program, is so structured to go to the larger system, systems, uh, they get about 60% of, of those funds. So it's not really a fair distribution. So we said, put it in A and B and maybe take a billion dollars and put it uh, in the 53 uh, uh, with the program coming up uh, in FY21 uh, monies, 100% funding um, and uh, that way the money, uh, those grants would have gone out. They're already out. By the way, the grant, uh, if your congressional member uh, has not notified you yet, um, the congressional notifications for this year's uh, 5339B program uh, have been announced. Uh, uh, I was glad to hear that my uh, association with the Iowa Public Transit Association, we got $5.5 million this year. So there, the announcements are out. FTA hasn't had announced them yet, but I'm sure they will do theirs in the next few days. Yeah, so I think that the critical issue to raise with this group of operators is the fact that small urbans, mid-sized systems, are um, I think most highly at risk in a lot of the decision making that's going on right now with regards uh, supplemental appropriations uh, to combat COVID. Um, uh, we yesterday in, in sessions in the general manager session, one of the first things we asked was like, how long is your CARES Act funding gonna last? Because that's the, that's the critical question right now. How long will your CARES Act funding last? And juxt, juxtaposed against how long will the state and local funding issues that are going to reduce your, your income in those areas, how long do you think that's going to last? And, and um, we had a, a virtual expo earlier in, in the first week of June Alex Clifford, who's a member of Sun and a, and a, a long-time contributor and a general manager at Santa Cruz Metro, um, has in some ways taken the lead. And I asked Alex if he wouldn't mind um, uh, unmuting himself and talk a little bit uh, about some of the work he's been doing. And most importantly, I'd like all of the other Sun members to hear 
his perspective on this because I think it's it's critical that um, you 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 get what's at risk here. Alex, please go ahead. Hey Scott, how how you doing? I'm doing Good well. Good to see everybody. You're putting on a great conference. Thank you. Um, let, let me just uh, pile on and give a, a great shout out to what Ed Redfern and the Bus Coalition are doing. You know, on everything related to reauthorization and anything related to 5339 A and B, they're just doing a fantastic job for us. And, you know, kudos to them. Um, I need to send less of my money to APTA and more of it over to the Bus Coalition and the CTAA. That's my political statement for the day. Um, <laughs> So, I can't so, say that, Alex, but I'm glad you can. <laughs> <laughs> that I can. Um, hey, you know, you, you mentioned that I was on that panel. Um, you know, my only encouragement in the panel was for everyone to create as sophisticated a model as you can uh, on how you will use the CARES Act money so that you don't prematurely make very severe and irreversible decisions relative to cutting service and laying off and furloughing employees. Um, look at that money, look at how you can use it against your already uh, savings, that, some of the savings that you're incurring as a result of having to reduce service. We all had to reduce service. Now we're all thinking about how do we get back to where we need to be. Social distancing creates some complications in, in how you uh, serve as many people in that environment. But nonetheless, try to stretch that CARES Act money out as far as you can. Because one, uh, you know, we just don't know if there's another bridge that's going to come. And that's all CARES Act was, is a bridge. We're thankful for it. But it was a, a very necessary, much needed bridge. What does that next bridge look like? That's what they're talking about today in Washington, D.C., right? Yep. Um, so, so model it. Be careful. Try not to make rash decisions that you might regret later on. You might find that money will carry you just a little bit further than you thought. For me, my model continuously changes, right? On any given day, I might get a new piece of information from the feds, from the state, that changes the, the loss of revenues, particularly related to economy-based revenues like sales tax dollars. Um, so they might change that, it might get worse, it might get better, we go in and we plug that in the model. We get some real data, right? Sales tax dollars lag by two months, we get the sales tax dollars from two months ago, they're better, they're worse, we change our model. Uh, well, we put it into the assumption of the model and the outcome changes. And right now it looks like for us, we can probably make it through the first quarter of next year with the CARES Act money. So that's, and if we do some strategic things, um, we might be able to stretch it out a little bit further depending on what happens in DC. So just closing, I don't wanna to be too long winded Scott, but just closing on that point, um, I just sent my little editorial comment through the chat. Um, I'm, I'm just really disturbed at at uh, the, the power that New York MTA uh, and CTA Chicago are exerting on, and LA Metro, they're just as guilty, are exerting on, on the APTA process these days to the detriment of the small and mid-sized agencies. This approach they came up with is just wrong. Why break a good thing? The CARES Act had it right. The money flowed through the formulas. The formulas acknowledge our productivity, our, our area populations. It got it right. I'm completely satisfied. And quite frankly, New York MTA should be satisfied because out of the $24 billion, they got their $3, $3 billion that they were asking for at the time. If they need $4 billion this time, then just help to advocate for more overall dollars as opposed to trying to, in effect, let me just be blunt, steal the money that should be going to the small and mid-sized properties to their benefit based on this bogus argument that everybody should be concerned about their $4 billion loss. Well, you know what, their $4 billion loss, let's call it a 40% loss of revenues, just for the sake of argument, a 40% loss of revenues for me at 20, 20 million is just as devastating to my agency as it is to New York MTA. On a relative basis, we're both in deep doo-doo and in jeopardy of being shut down. So why, why go the approach of, you know, my problems are bigger than your problems and I need more money. Why doesn't New York MTA, Chicago, CTA, and LA Metro, the big dogs, uh, and Muni and San Francisco to a, to, to a lesser extent, why aren't they all getting on the same uh, argument, on board with the same argument, which is all ships rise, right? Let's all work to make the pot bigger. The distribution method was right. Let's work to make the pot bigger and we will all succeed and we will all survive. And then the thing, Alex, that, you know, is disturbing kind of um, preview 
is how this has rolled through the democratic led house um and and you know who knows what's going to happen in the election in november but let's be honest we could easily be seeing a fully democratic led congress and an administration and that's what really concerns me is you know there's 300 and some odd small cities out there that need to be speaking up right now and we need we need to the bus coalition needs to 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 do what they continue to do what they're doing we need to make sure that this doesn't become an either or proposition but rather um i've i've often chafed at the uh, the rising tide lifts all boats theory rich has probably heard my rants about that for for decades but in this case i'm like yes that that is that is the right approach. Uh, Rich, you wanted to add something. Yeah, and Scott, and I just want to echo Alex's concerns here. Uh, he's been a national leader on this point, and his concerns have percolated up to a lot of our members, even though he's in California. And if you know Alex, he's not usually a fiery guy, but what we just saw there is how concerned he is about the situation. So I want to thank Alex first for his, for his role yeah. on this. Uh, but key to watch in the Senate bill is and this is a key sticking point between Dem uh, the House and the Senate right now, is state and local funding for the governments in local areas, which are trying to compensate for the loss in sales tax revenue and other local revenue, often which gets channeled to the, the transit system. So not only does the Senate bill not have a lot of transit in, uh, funding in it, there's no support for those governments that provide the local match for these dollars too. So the Senate, what's happened in the Senate bill so far is should be very concerning. At the same time, we have a House bill that has a flawed distribution mechanism. So yeah. nothing here in, in the second round of CARES, they did so well at the first one, like Alex was saying, is lining up quite to what we're looking for. And I think that should be concerning to anybody around the country here in the small and, and rural areas too. Well, uh, Just one last point, if I might. Yes. I, I, first of all, I want to thank CTA for writing the, the letter, the base letter that I basically replicated in my letter, um, supporting the formula. You guys did a great job. Um, second, I just want to thank the 19 CEOs uh, from small and mid-sized agencies who on very short notice, I gave them basically 72 hours to read it, give me some edits and sign off on it, which is why we only got 19, but 19 significant nationwide small mid-sized properties and others asked afterwards, hey, can I have a copy? I want to replicate it. I want to send it to my elected officials. So. You know, thank you for starting that ball rolling. Well, one of the things that I think we need to do here, and um, anybody in the audience, we have the spreadsheet that Alex put together, which he's using to do that planning mechanism that he was just discussing, um, that, that uh, on a monthly basis or on a regular basis is giving him an indication on how long his funds are gonna last. We need to hear from 40, 50, 60 systems in this size about where you're looking in terms of those CARES Act funding, how long that's gonna extend and what's at stake when that runs out for you. So that we can start to, as, as has been pointed out in the chat box, 350 small cities have a lot more votes. We've just got to get those members to understand what's at stake here and, and, and we've got to do it soon. Um, they are mired in partisan bickering right now, and that is the way DC works. But be assured that early next week, they're gonna to start to get towards resolutions and they need to hear from you. So, so if you're considering, you wanna, uh, we'll post up the letter here in the chat box that you can look at and download, use that send me a copy so I know that you've spoken to somebody, send that to your House and Senate members. Senate really is the focus now, so send it to your senators. And, um, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to see 32 billion in this CARES Act 2.0 and it totally leave out you folks. Other um, comments and questions? Go ahead, Ed. You know, one of the things, the bus coalition basically uh our goal is to stay within the 5339 program uh we try not to go outside of that 
I don't think, and Alex is on our board, I don't think our board would have a problem at all, nor do I think it's wrong, that, that the, the formula is the way to go uh, because it's everybody's taken care of. Um, and it, they can do with it whatever their needs are. But to have a bill similar to what happened in MAP 21, where the money is taken and moved under MAP 21, and in this case, totally leaving out 90% of all of the transit systems in the country is wrong. And the Senate, I think, recognizes that. And I think that's why, for most part, you didn't see any transportation in their bill because they know they're going to have to deal with it in conference committee. And so I think uh, hopefully our Senate partners that are from smaller systems other than uh, the speaker and the minority leader in the Senate, that they take notice and they say, hey, our systems are in just as much trouble and they need to be taken care of too. Long term, that level of broader support for transit and understanding of the value that transit brings to all states, all congressional districts, will benefit everyone, including the MTA in New York. Well, the thing about it, I think, uh, Scott, is that we all recognize they have big needs. Absolutely. And, and we're not against them but we ought to be working together so that we're all on the same page. And that's, that's what Alex is talking about. And I think that's what you're talking about. That's what's important. Yeah. And, and again, what, what troubles me is the freelancing that's going on uh, uh, and, and where that leads us. Um, so let, let's move on. If there's nothing else on, on CARES Act 2.0 in the interest of time, Let's go on to this little matter of reauthorization of the FAST Act, which uh, is, um, is uh, uh, heating up. Uh, you know, the, the, the House has passed, uh, House passed out of committee, the Invest Act, largely along party lines, and then kind of folded it into a larger moving, moving forward act, HR2. Um, which has a lot of other pieces to it. Um, the, the process to get to this from the House perspective, CTA was a little concerned about the, the, the lack of communication between uh, uh, T and I Republicans and Democrats. But in the end, it's a very positive first step for reauthorizing, reauthorizing the FAST Act and one that um, you know, we've expressed support for, even with our misgivings about it being a little, a little partisan. Um, the numbers you, you can't, you can't uh, refute. There, there, there's a lot in this bill. And I'll let Ed talk first because, you know, the, the, the long-term impact of what the bus coalition has done is what you really see in how much emphasis the Invest Act had on bus services, bus capital. Um, all of a sudden, there was really good discussions about uh, uh, incentivizing frequency and higher ridership in bus operations. And you contrast that to, as he had, as Ed had raised, MAP 21, where they just cast bus aside, literally. It's amazing how far we've come. Uh, and, and so, uh, Ed, give us some insights on, on where your group is and what you're, what you're most supportive of in, in the FAST Act, because there's a lot to, or in the, in the INVEST Act, there's a lot to support there. Well, what's uh, interesting, if you look at the change from the FAST Act over to the uh, uh, House passed legislation, uh, the INVEST Act, we... We believe uh, beyond our total imagination of what was in that bill. 
for bus transit systems. Uh, we got a 150% increase in bus transit funding in that bill where the rest of the uh, uh, transit industry got a 50% uh, increase. Um, uh, we were very concerned when we heard they wanted to basically drop the uh, grant program uh, because that's the only fair way we believe that you have an opportunity in 5339 because of the way the formula is structured um, that you have a good chance of getting your larger projects funded. Yeah. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, that was uh, taken care of. And in, in fact, it was. So I think overall, we all ought to be very happy with it's, what's, what's in the House bill. We, we talked a great deal with the committee staff about our concerns that if the funding is not at the level that they're proposing and dropping the grant program and formalizing it, that you would not necessarily have as good a chance to take care of those larger lumpy needs that you have. Uh, I know a lot of you are going to have buses that are going to come due because of uh, uh, getting them funded uh, through the um, program uh, that was uh, happening when we had the last recession. And you got a lot of buses that are coming due in 2022, uh, right in the middle of this bill. And if you don't have the funds to do it, those buses are going to be beyond their useful life. So, um, we think that there's a need to make sure that there's adequate funding on the Senate side bill. Uh, we, were, we were working hard uh, with CTAA, uh, either um, Scott or uh, Tyler would go with us to Hill meetings. We met with a lot of appropriators and authorizers during uh, when you could get on the Hill uh, to talk about those issues and try and make sure that they understood your bus needs. Uh, we've been pushing actually to keep the, on the Senate side, the grant program, just in case there's not the amount of funds that are available. If you look at the highway bill that was passed, there was only a 27% increase on the Senate side. If that holds true, then uh, not having a grant program uh, that's adequately funded will make it extremely hard for you to get those lumpy needs uh, taken care of. So there's a lot in that House bill that really is good uh, for us. Uh, and so we continue to push the House side. We don't expect that the Senate side will be that uh, high. On Bloomberg this morning, uh, there are a number of committee chairmen that are saying, we need to push the reauthorization off to next year. So we may see some things happening along the lines uh, of that kind of uh, a program pushed. Thanks, Ed. And yeah, I mean, there is a lot in there. Um, Rich, why don't you take us through some of what your impressions were with uh, Invest? And Thanks, while you're doing that, I'm going to share some charts just that Rich had put together that I think really show the growth in all of the programs. Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And of course, agree with Ed on this. And if you look at some of these charts, the trend line and kind of the shape of the, the geography of the graph is the same on each chart. You can see kind of steady uh, growth through the FAST Act era, and then pretty whopping increase, and then the steady growth after that in the uh, Invest Act, should that come to pass. The, the key thing is looking at that 5339 program the changes that at least the House wanted to make in terms of formula versus competitive, you obviously see um, much higher formula rates. Uh, they want that to be more predictable and widespread. Um, you also see the low emissions program skyrocket. Uh, the House really wants to push uh, battery electric and all, you know zero emissions programs, and they've pretty much stripped out the low emissions part. The good part, part of that is because of the standard overall bus capital program. If you want to do all fuels, you know, like propane or CNG, uh, the House really believes those funds are there for you in the formula and competitive program. So 
It's a little concerning if you look at the removal of the low emissions part to just no in the Invest Act. Indeed. But uh, they do really want to make those vehicles available through the formula program. And I think you heard that from Alka and uh, some other folks on the committee staff there as they explain the bill. But you have to look into it a little closer. Uh, so obviously, the good thing here is the House, you know, kind of resoundingly on the Democrat side, passed this really strong show of support for the transit industry. And it's a good placeholder for if nothing happens this year, the House can pretty readily readopt this bill if the Democrats remain in control there and not have to do a lot of new work there. Uh, so that's all positive. And I think uh, those folks really hurt us. I echo uh, Scott's concern about kind of the lack of bipartisan working together um, amongst the staff, as we usually see from that from the TNI committee. That is a concern long term. We hope that settles down if uh, if Congress and uh, different uh, you know folks are in charge there. I do want to highlight a few. Um, interesting aspects that we supported at SWATA, and I, I'm pretty sure CTA and the Bus Coalition did too, is uh, note that there's a um, disaster exemption on reporting, regardless of COVID for small urban areas uh, from NTD reporting. Uh, that's helpful if you if you uh, be, are beset by a natural disaster or like Ozark Regional Transit and your vehicles all catch on fire. Uh, they want to take that into account in your NTD reporting and cognify that in the, in the statute uh, for, for the first time here. That's good. Um, there's some new exemptions in the charter rule uh, that apply to most small urban and rural providers. Uh, we did some work with that along with CTA and uh, SWAT members in Oklahoma. Uh, so I'm not going to spend on the, any time on the details on that, but that was a good development to see. And yeah. if you usually don't take a look at the highway aspect, the FHWA provisions in the, in the transit reauthorization. Take some look here. Uh, House T and I hired Jackie uh, away from Senator uh, Menendez's office to particularly work on the highway uh, provisions of the bill. And there is significant funding there in the highway side for supporting transit and TOD activities that uh, are much more uh, what we're looking for, for that from that program. So I'd encourage you to take a look through that uh, FHWA section when you take a look at the bill if you haven't yet. Um, so overall, we're, we'd love to see these, um, these trends and provisions included in the Senate side. Um, I think there is pretty strong support uh, for growing the bus program, uh, but not to the levels that we see in the House side on the Senate side, as Ed was describing. Uh, we have some good, good supporters in our, in our neck of the woods in the SWATA nation, like Senator Moran, Senator Heinrich from New Mexico, even some of the Oklahoma folks are listening. So uh, that need to express the, the, the provision that transit matters everywhere is really important in the SWAT nation. I know it matters for CTAs. We can't just rely on the Northeastern and coastal Democrats to boost transit. It has to be strong everywhere. And I think that's a particular concern in this, on the Senate side as we move forward. So Scott, I'll turn it back to you here. Yeah, just a couple other things to, to spotlight in the invest or in HR2 um, that I think are important to this group. One, um, if you're a stick community, that has been raised to 3% of the total pot, which should boost significantly your, your 5307 uh, stick uh, per factor, uh, 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 which is, a, which is we're, we were happy with and, and, and worked hard on. Um, Another interesting thing, piece to look at too is there's, there's some changes in procurement that I think uh, all small cities ought to be looking at and, and also um, Buy America. Uh, uh, a major change would, uh, the House is proposing that FTA take that kind of over so you wouldn't have to um, perform Buy America audits you would only be allowed to, ve to purchase vehicles that had already passed, which um, is one of those things that kind of has a concern to me because on the one side, why every agency was having to do that individually, yes, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but on the other side, how do we make sure that FTA does this timely uh, and with reduced administrative funding off into FTA? Um, so, so, it's a, something that kind of bears following. Um, two other pieces that were in the uh, INVEST Act 
Uh, one, it called for 5.8 billion outside of the money that it's calling for in the Invest Act um, to be a supplemental COVID-19 piece and to put all 5.8 billion through the formula program. Uh, we'd like to see that obviously. And it also makes FY21 appropriations 100% federal. So it kind of continues that local share flexibility for a further year. You know, all of these local share flexibilities, as we mentioned in a couple of different places yesterday and bears, bears repeating here, does create the unintended consequence in squeezed local and state budgets, the notion that, well, we don't have to fund transit anymore because you're getting all this additional money at 100% federal. So like anything else, there are, um, there are, are pluses or pros and cons to anything, but that's also in the bill. I would really just love, uh, one, open up to questions on reauthorization. You know, what to expect? The Senate's working on it. The administration periodically says they're gonna come out with something. We haven't seen anything. I'll ask Matt uh, uh, upcoming about that. I'm not sure if he's privy to any of those details or, or can share, but we'll ask. And timing wise, I think the real expectation should be next spring, that, that we, we, we should see a Senate bill prior to fast acts expiration in the end of September, and then those will languish until the new Congress seats and the presidential elections are done. So, you know, February, March, um, it's gonna be our goal to get reauthorization at the top of the agenda because I have a lot of concerns longer term about congressional buyer's remorse for all the money that's been going out the door in trillions uh, uh, and all the deficits that that is going to create. And, and uh, uh, you know, to have a reauthorization locked in for five years is gonna be critical coming up. So we're gonna do everything we can to try to get that as high up the priority list as possible to be dealt with um, and the last thing that you have to say about the INVEST Act is, as those charts showed, it's all great. There's no pay for as discussed. So it is purely a bill talking about how they're going to spend a lot of money with no discussion of where that money comes from. And that's always a concern. We've seen that in the past. Chris Zeilinger, who's I know I see him chatting and is on the CTA staff and looks at these things. He immediately, when this came out, said, boy, this reminds me of about 2008, 2009 with Congressman Oberstar and kind of a, a massive bill that didn't have pay-fors. And what did that create? Well, it created three years of extensions of Safety Lou and then a really quickly and probably to our thinking poorly thought through uh, MAP-21 that we've been trying to un, un dig ourselves out of ever since. So it's a, it's a mixed bag right now where we are on this. Scott, one of the things that uh, the bus coalition uh, had as a priority is to get, a, get back to the 40-40-20 split on federal funds, 40% for uh, safe, uh, state of good repair, uh, 40% for the new starts, and then 20% for buses. So no matter what the level of funding is, across the board, we get lifted up back to our traditional 20% of the funds. We should be in uh, uh, better shape than we have been, not where we want to be, but uh, at least whatever the, the dollar amount is, we would uh, get back, because we're only at about 14%. Of what the of the federal funds, and we need to get that back up uh, uh, to help uh, push the bus programs. And our and our colleagues at APTA are pushing 40, 40, 20 as well. Um, that's in their plan, and I've been in meetings where they've discussed and and advocated vigorously for that. So uh, that is another good outcome of the work the bus coalition has done, as it's it's forced the discussion in that direction, which has been a good one. All right, well, let's move on to our last topic, which 
I think we can handle somewhat quickly, which is FY21 appropriations, just kind of what's happened last week, the House passed um, a minibus that included uh, T-HUD, which is the transportation piece. Um, again, massive bill, uh, 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 major increases. You know, I, I think we calculated it at a 53% increase over current year. Um, uh, uh, the Senate is, is lagging somewhat, but, uh, uh, you know, and this is a place of probes. I think really where the bus coalitions work on behalf of bus funding has shined and where you've emphasized a lot of your efforts is uh, Ed. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, came out of that, uh, of what we've been doing, we started a bus caucus on the Hill. And um, we've got about 30 some members. So if, you're, if you can get your uh, members of the house to become members of the bus caucus, that would be great. What really shined was the 500, 499, whatever the final number was, a million dollar plus up, because yeah. this is the final year of the plus up. And that alone, I think we had 64 house members sign on a letter to the appropriators asking for that plus up. Uh, and uh, we got a great number in the house. We just need the Senate to go along with that. But from that standpoint, that, that's, that's a good plus up um, for the grant programs. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're looking at, where did we start, Ed? 2012, 2013, we were looking at like a $400 million program, uh, you know, one that had been cut by more than 50% to today. Our, 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 our discussions are, are around, uh, we're talking in the billions now. Yeah. And, and um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, we're making up for a lost time. Okay, but, let's let, let, go ahead. But that's led that that's the work of everybody that's on this phone call. Yes, getting to their members so that their congressional members understand how important that is to your being able to make your systems run. Uh, it's not the work I don't think that any of the three of us necessarily do. It's what you do to make it happen, I, and and that's just my opinion. Rich, you have anything you wanna you wanna add in on a probes? Uh, well, of course, you know Ed's totally right. It's uh, you guys are the, uh, the difference makers, and we need you now more than ever uh, to keep making those calls and those building those personal relationships. Uh, on a probes, I think you know the key thing is that all the formula programs and uh, of course continued growth in the bus program uh, really need to at least hit their um, fast gas act marks here. Um, and I, that hasn't been a, a problem in the last few years, but it's just concerning anytime we're, we're in this kind of, uh, you know, crisis situation that they might look at any programs as uh, an across the board rescission. Uh, we know that small urban providers particularly uh, budget to the last dollar on those predictable funds. And we need to see 5307 fully match its, at least mass, match it at its, its fast act levels and the other programs as well. Um, and we, we want to see, you know, like there's this, this opinion out there that there's always a, bit, a fight about transit funds. And that really doesn't actually take place across the formula programs. It really is limited to the capital investment grant programs. Of course, SWATA has some large agencies that do benefit from those programs. But uh, anytime that we can re reinforce the notion amongst those leaders in Congress and their staffs that the formula programs have been steady and rising every year uh, really dispels the notion that there's any kind of controversy about uh, those transit programs when I think Jane Williams has said, you know, 10% of the funding accounts for 98% of the attention on transit funds every year. Uh, keep reminding your members that it's the 5307 program and for the rural and 5310 providers that those programs aren't controversial amongst anybody. Uh, so keep that message going and uh, We'll be uh, letting you know some of the details. Uh, in the House bill, there was 1.5 million added to the, um, to the low and no program uh, in, the, in the House of Probes. Uh, saw that come through from uh, 
I believe Representative Stanton uh, from Arizona. There's a couple other things in terms of HUD funding and um, community engagement that were in the House approach bill that uh, we've seen. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in any of those, uh, both Scott and I have some details on those. So those are my thoughts on a prep, Scott. Yeah, and you know, the Senate across the board is lagging behind the House, which seems to be what we're dealing with right now. Um, uh, will be inter interesting to see how they deal with that with the upcoming recess for most of this month about to hit. And then they, they if you look at the, the congressional calendar, there's a return for a couple weeks in September and then another recess for uh, work in the district. So there's not a lot of time to deal with um, uh, uh, just, just overarching the three things that we've brought up today, which would be the, the supplemental, you know, CARES Act 2.0, they're gonna deal with that. It's gonna be a fight, it is a fight. And then there's gonna be a probes uh, the Senate coming out with a reauthorization package for surface transportation. That's a lot just in our little corner of the world for the Congress to get done in the limited time. So, so we are running up against that, but uh, 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 it's good to see such a robust approach to bill pass the House. And, and be the first thing out of the door, kind of like the INVEST Act on the, on the reauthorization side. Um, these things have to start somewhere and it's much better to start at high numbers than uh, the opposite. So uh, with that, I see it's about 11.53. Uh, we've got about 10, 15 minutes to engage with you. Um, please fire questions. If you wanna just kind of make a comment, just put your name in the chat box and I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself and turn your video on and, and, and uh, have at it. This is, a, you know, this is meant to be a dialogue, not a uh, lecture. So uh, who, who out there has either a question or a, a uh, comment you'd like to make? And don't be shy. While that's while while you're you're gathering yourselves, uh, Chris did note something that I saw as well that there is uh, rumor that the uh, the administration may be considering grabbing back unobligated CARES Act funds. Um, in our next next session coming up here shortly, I know Matt will give us the rundown on how much of the 25 billion in the CARES Act has been obligated. And uh, 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 I don't know if he'll comment on, on what's been said uh, about, uh, uh, as, as Chris pointed out, um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the rescission, I guess, or, or taking back of unobligated CARES Act funds, um, but it's something to um, be concerned about. So there's no comments from, from this group. You're, 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 you're pleased with the legislative direction that we've laid out here. And uh, uh, there's, there's, there's uh, no additional issues you want us to kind of focus on? And I say that facetiously because I know it's not true. Well, um, folks are being bashful or they're organizing their thoughts. I just want to share a couple um, events we have coming up this afternoon and Monday in the chat box, uh, sessions on contact tracing for transit and also a debate on fare free transit featuring Kansas City and St. Louis on Monday. These are open to all of you, uh, no registration fees or anything like that. Uh, we'd love for you, for you to hop on any of those uh, sessions. Just quick plug there uh, while we're waiting. Well, Absent any comments, then I'm going to say thanks, and I'm going uh, uh, to ask you all to uh, our next session. We'll begin uh, with is is one of our sponsored coffee breaks. It will start in 20 minutes. Oh wait, we do have one. Thank you, Tim. Tim from Corvallis, who's a regular Sun Conference participant with Corvallis Transit. He says, I'm interested in NTD. Please explain more about reporting for next year. Uh, Rich, you, you kind of touched on that. You wanna, you wanna uh, uh, underscore that? Yeah, uh, well, in the CARES Act uh, was a provision for 
going back to last year's um, reported numbers to NTD for, I believe, this year and next. And uh, I know Chris will actually have the, the best read on that, but uh, it is certainly for this year and I, I think for 2021 as well to use your last uh, full year uh, numbers report for NTD so that you're not uh, penalized for the drop down in service and ridership uh, for COVID here. So um, that's, that's kind of the high level look at it. Uh, I think there's some movement afoot uh, from folks trying to extend that for a couple of years for perhaps the rural and small urban programs. Uh, we'll see how that shakes out in either a CARES 2.0 or a PROPS or anything like that. But um, and I guess uh, Tim's question is, will it pertain to stick, stick funding as well? Uh, yes, that's, it, it includes that stick set aside, Tim. Well, so, you know, and I stuff. think we'll, I'll make sure um, our FTA partners that are joining for, for the, the session that begins at uh, 1245 uh, address that as well, because it's, it's really important. And Chris, you want to you wanna open up your video and, and audio and, and, and join? Because I think, I know you have some, um, I know you have some, some comments about it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll open up the, the, the audio. Um, do want to show off my, my, my COVID casual look right now. Um, but basically, to, to underscore Tim's point and Rich's point on NTD stuff, yes, indeed, for the current year and probably for next year. And there is language in the pending authorization bills that would do it for another year. Uh, looking back at reporting year 19 as the baseline currently and uh, for the near future, because I think everyone realizes that these are these times are too weird across the entire country to be using 2020 da data for much of anything other than a statistical anomaly. Um, while I've got the mic, I'll also underscore a point that we raised briefly in this and something to, to think about maybe you know, over your coffee break and take it up in the future, is um, to look at making the case for continuing the 100% federal share on FDA formula dollars. That's in the House, House bill. Uh, one of the things that, that um, you know, and I was having side conversations with a couple of you all during, the, during you know, this session about this, is state and local governments are gonna be socked big time financially next year no matter what happens. And if you're dependent on state or local dollars or locally generated taxes for your non-federal share, which you are, um, having a continuing the CARES Act 100% federal into the formula program could be important. So let's think about making that case or being prepared to make that case to some reluctant members of Congress after the election, if, if, it ha if we have to wait that long. Um, Barbara Neal raised a quick question about my favorite yeah. topic, which is census, and then I'll I say, myself you've got the right answer. person, Barbara, with Chris here. Uh, which is, there's a lot of concern, well, there's a lot of moving pieces here that we really don't know, and a lot of it, unfortunately, is swirled in a lot of partisan politics, so it makes me real, real uncomfortable to talk about it. Um, the online participation in the census got to about 60% participation, which is better than it was expecting. The census Bureau is backing up on the door-to-door -door canvassing. They're gonna use statistical methods to uh, determine who lives where. Uh, that runs a risk of, of exacerbating a rural undercount and a non-English speaking undercount and an African-American undercount. That's not a partisan statement, that's just a demographic statement. Um, and so we don't know how all that's going to play out. The other thing that a lot of people have been worried about is population shifts, doing census count at a time where people have relocated, uh, college students not on campus when typically they're counted for those of you that are in college communities. You might find that you've suddenly lost a lot of population because all those kids that were in college two years ago weren't there when the census was being counted this year. So there's a lot of unknowns there. Let's just be, pre be prepared for some it was surprises in the census, and it's impossible for me to predict what's going to happen beyond a few surprises. I hope they're one-offs, not national anomalies. But that's my my census talk. But if anyone wants to follow up with more census conversations, you all know where to find me. I love talking about census 25 hours a day. So uh, just you know, reach out. Yeah, and you know the census stuff is so important for the obvious. Just 
rural, small urban, mid-sized urban, and, 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 and the rules that go along with those. But, you know, in that House Invest Act, you see funding uh, programs set aside for um, census tracts with high poverty rates. You see a rural persistent poverty program. There are lots of um, uh, almost, I don't want to call them performance-based, but there are issues that the census can trigger and opportunities that the census can trigger. In, in the past, and Chris, you recall this well from 2010, there's a lot about um, uh, grandfathering certain ideas and, and so that people, when, when there are these census changes, it doesn't just door shut and, and we're done. Uh, I've seen some language in invest uh, that seems to indicate that they're gonna put two and three years worth of that into this. But even with that, it's got to be difficult. It's going to be difficult, and, and it's something we're concerned about. Um, uh, let's see, we got a question about uh, NTD, uh, common and mobility NTD funding. Um, uh, can you, Kate, can you be a little bit more specific on that, um, just so that we can make sure we're targeting your question? And if you want to jump on the mic like you did yesterday, I'm happy to have, great. <laughs> Hi, thanks. I'm not sure I have a very uh, well articulated way to talk about this issue, but um, I think long term we need to be thinking about how to um, change some of the NTD and funding formulas to allow us to be bigger collaborators on other mobility types. So okay. for example here, bike shares coming to town, which I think is wonderful for mobility. I'm really excited about it, but there is a fear about impacting our stick funding if people are using the bike share program instead of transit. And ultimately, I think that that's problematic and that there's got to be a way for Mountain Line to potentially benefit from the bike share through NTD or contribute funding to it because ultimately that's achieving the goals that we want to achieve for this community. Um, but right now there's a fear we might impact our stick. And so I think long-term that's problematic. I don't think that that's something I expect to be resolved in this reauthorization, but conversations that we as a community need to start having long-term. I think it's a really good point. And uh, it's something that most of you in your communities are dealing with. And how do you juxtapose? You, you don't want to end up supporting issues that could lower a stick factor or two or three because that's going to be very expensive but you've got these objectives particularly many of you like in university towns and others where you want to to move those types of micro transit concepts and organize them in ways that uh, network well with your operations and ideally uh, i think the place we'd all like to get to is uh, you, you can count those pieces and, and bring them in uh, uh, into, into your, your, your uh, NTD and, and factors. So thanks, thanks, Kate, for putting a finer point on that issue. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, we're, we, I can tell you we're all concerned, the census stuff, and um, Chris does follow that really closely. You can, uh, his email is his last name at cta.org. Um, he's put together a couple of documents um, that we are happy to share. If you, if you ask for them on, on the census, just shoot Chris or I an email and I'll, I'll make sure you get those uh, things where, we're, where he's taken a much uh, more uh, close look at, at, at kind of potential issues that can be raised with the census. All right, well, we are gonna now, uh, after that burst of, and thanks for, for all the uh, inputting and engagement, we're gonna take a, a, a quick break, but we will um, be back. Uh, what time are we starting? The, uh, the uh, coffee break uh, uh, is gonna be at 12.15 with our, a new sponsor, a new organization, uh, fresh to be working with CTA Curis. And uh, uh, we are really are, uh, they've got a lot of interesting products when it comes to cleaning and decan decontaminating your buses. And uh, unfortunately, that's a big issue right now. So I'd urge you to join us for uh, uh, a little, little break time with Curis at 1215. And then after that, we'll have our FTA leadership session, which will be starting at 1245. So thanks everyone for participating. Thanks Rich and Ed for all of your contributions to this session. 
and for the uh, continuing uh, good work on behalf of small urban transit systems. Take care, everyone. See you soon.